The man who kind of st stood outside was an extremely talented uh, artist. Um, Franz Mark was German, and had he not been slaughtered, killed in uh, the First World War, I mean, we would probably have an extraordinary painter throughout the 20th century, at least. He loved animals. He loved animals, but he conceived of animals in abstract terms, sort of gave them the soul. Uh, the colors, of course, of course, are arbitrary because, well, that's what one does now. After Fauvism, one uses abstract colors, uh, one, uh, one distorts reality for the sake of expression. And here uh, are his blue horses, and uh, in uh, 1911 he paints them as, uh, and he paints them sort of, again, uh, as, as a force, as energy, uh, full of vitality, full of creative, creative uh, uh, strength. They look like a wave. They look yes, like right? Like rolling waves of water. They, when you're on the beach and you see the foam, uh -huh lapping against yeah. the sand. It looks like horses. That's true. They, are, they undulate and, and the sunset there. But he'll develop this theme uh, later. Uh, here also he is already under the influence of this completely new attitude to art, which is Cubism, which, are, which is something that Picasso and Brock will develop. And you see it here, the splintering of physical reality. The denunciation of perspective, the, uh, uh, the presentation of several planes of uh, visual reality uh, at the same time, and, uh, and all that against uh, uh, an interesting rainbow. Uh, he'll, he'll continue to do it with the animals. We see some deer or maybe fawn, yeah, little fawn, you see a little Bambi there? And there's the mother because there are no, there, I don't see any antlers. So I see female deer, not so much the male deer. They're all splintering in different planes because into the cubic plane as representing different sides of reality. Um, they'll talk about this whole thing with relativity, of course, and Albert Einstein. But yeah, I mean, these people weren't physicists, nor were they... Uh, well, Kandinsky tried to be a, a philosopher, but neither Brock nor Picasso were. Either that or the other. Well, Cezanne kind of did it before them. The fact is, when we look at at a sub at, at, at an object, uh, uh, of course, ever since the Renaissance, uh, the one point perspective was uh, was developed, and it was the panacea uh, of all difficulties. Just learn how to do the one point perspective, and set your figures accordingly, and you'll have a picture. And um, it was like a golden medium for for the art, the, for the artists, beginning with, with the Renaissance. But then, even those beautiful paintings, I mean, that's not exactly how we see the world. The moment we turn around, we see a different perspective, perhaps. We see a different view, and that's what, that's what Cezanne really comprehended. He comprehended that the picture he was drawing was not just the landscape in front of him, but also the way he saw it. And that's when we talked about him. Uh, his his uh, writing his letters to his son in Paris that I mean here I am I, I sit in front of a house and but the moment I move a little that house looks differently and the planes of that house look differently that's why Cezanne became uh, the godfather of cubism and but you see it uh, here as well also I mean there's a, there's a fly on the wall and uh, we cannot order the fly's behavior. But so long as that fly is in the same room as we are, her behavior will be influenced by us. Because instead of just sitting on the wall, if we move, uh, it will uh, fly as well. And yet it doesn't change the fact that the fly looks like a fly. But the movement will change. And uh, I mean, so everything is, everything is interrelated. And that's what's going to be the thing with cubism. Nothing can be perceived separately, as a separate object. Or even this separate object will have different qualities depending on how we look at it. So we are part of what we are painting. I mean, that's the idea. And uh, so as you see, uh, Mark here picks up on that as well. And he represents the forest now as if he is running through it. And if you run through the forest, we don't just see, uh, say, the trees separately you see them flickering by you and then you may see an occasional 
uh, an occasional um, group of animals that are in that forest and again you'll be seeing them as flickering by and that's the idea here so as i said so he's clearly very influenced already by cubism there are all sorts of isms are happening and we'll talk about them and another ism that's coming out of italy now will be called futurism and the whole idea of futurism is just destroy the past you don't want the past the uh, the uh, the prophet of futurism by the name of marinetti uh, wished for war as uh, as the cleanser of humanity. I mean, when the war came, they they obviously thought very differently. They wished to splinter everything that stood in the way of progress. They wanted the machine age. Everything had to be splintered. So and so that. Even though Cubism didn't feel that it was part of Cubism, but all those influences were around. And that's why we see these paintings. So what you see here, that's kind of interesting. The progression, the progression is really very telling. Here is the our waves, our horses, and then they become, they become this unstoppable energy even mm -hmm. more so. And then everything is just splintered. And because as futurists wished, they wanted to destroy everything in the past and start anew. I think I like the horses best. I know, me too. But the progression is very interesting. No, the progression is fascinating. Fact, you, you understand this a lot better if you see the progression. It kind of it kind of looks like at the beginning you have a nice smooth wooden bowl, and then by the end you've taken a chisel to it, and you're just yes. splintering it, and there's yes. bits and, and cutting pieces at it. flying everywhere. And mm -hmm. yeah. Oskar Kokoschka, uh, an Austrian, who was part playwright uh, and uh, part uh, painter, also, uh, also, uh, he was a lover of uh, the the formidable Alma Mahler, uh, who was the wife of, uh, of Gustav Mahler, and then she'll go on to become um, the wife also of Walter Gropius, uh, of the Bauhaus fame, and and another artist after Gropius dies. Um, so, but for a while she was a lover of uh, Kokoschka, but that. Uh, clearly did not end in marriage. So um, he paints this, uh, this uh, very interesting, it's a huge canvas, it's something like, I'm a very large, 80 inches by 70 inches, it's rather large. And uh, he'll never paint anything that large again. And he presents himself with uh, Alma Mahler and both of them as if uh, they are as if lying in some sort of a shell of a boat and uh, but the boat is not on, on, on water this boat is floating in um, in the air its timbers you see are coming apart uh, there's some alpine crags that that one can see she's peacefully asleep and uh, but he's not he's uh, tense he is uh, clearly anxious and he paints them as such uh, because she is painted with much smoother brush than his whole his whole body is torn as his soul is um, seems to be torn it's possible that that he's what he's doing here is that he's kind of emulating this this brilliant art of um, William Blake and uh, uh, in the almost a hundred years earlier and William Blake, in his, who was a painter, a printer, an illustrator, just just a brilliant man in every way, um, uh, a romantic, of course. So he illustrated Dante's Inferno, and particularly the Paola and Francesco uh, theme. Uh, the Paola and Francesco that were lovers in life, but were condemned in the next world to to flow continuously, very close to one another but never be able to touch. And uh, so as Dante, as Virgil leads Dante into the nine circles uh, of, uh, uh, of hell, uh, he shows him, the Paolo and Francesco, as they float in this uh, endless, uh, endless river that flows um, underground. And, um, and so Dante asks Virgil to, to bring them out, which, uh, which Virgil does. And then Dante, then this is Virgil, and then Dante imagines them as they were in life, as united, as lovers, and he faints. 
so he paints uh, in uh, he's so impressed Popov of course knew about Blake everybody knew about Blake and revisiting that same uh, that same theme that that here they are together but uh, but his love perhaps is unrequited even though she's with him now in very faux very modern terms and then another very not really cubist, uh, but very expressive uh, artist, also Austrian, yeah, Egon Schiele, who led an interesting life. He, like Kirchner, he was a little like Kirchner, he was certainly a bohemian, and he was already in his, uh, in his uh, 20s, late 20s, he met a 17-year-old girl, and um, they began to cohabit together. Uh, but, but we have to remember that I mean, the society still lives very much under sort of very Victorian morals uh, on the outside, if not on the inside. But, uh, and so to fling uh, this, this very open cohabitation into society's face was, uh, was still not accepted. Uh, so they left Vienna where they felt uncomfortable and they went to a town where his mother was from. But that town, despite the, uh, the connection, did not approve either, so they had to leave. And, and wherever she and he were, they also sort of attracted, uh, attracted a company of girls. And at some point he was arrested for seducing a 13-year-old, because the official age, you see, was 14. Um, Still is in some European countries, by the way. Yeah. If you look it up, you know, ages of consent in Europe, it gets, it gets uncomfortable fast. Yeah, interesting. And he also painted them, uh, as, we, as we will see uh, in openly erotic attitudes. And as one artist uh, will say, that all art is erotic. Do you remember, we started talking about already with the Impressionists, and I said we'll talk about it more and more as we progress into the 20th century, a lot of it is going to be uh, about this uh, empathy le bourgeois, about very open sex, and also about men seeing women as they saw them, often as beastly and demonic, and, uh, and you'll see that with, um, uh, with Shelley as well. Uh, he will not spend much time in jail, but, uh, but some time he will spend there, and then as he was arrested, a number of his sketches were also uh, taken and, and exhibited in court and pronounced as brutally pornographic. Later on, he'll want to marry, but some very bourgeois, in fact, that would advance his, uh, uh, his position in, in society. But he was extremely, a, a very a powerful painter. I mean, he paints uh, his, uh, his friend who was in his circle, of course, the writer, painter, and he sees him as if he is in a trance himself with his sort of hands pointing a different direction, explaining the tra it's, it's almost as if he himself is at the, um, uh, having a seance. And what uh, Shelley was extremely uh, good at was conveying with very economic lines all the intensity that he wished to convey, and, uh, and as you see it here. This is uh, a self-portrait, and so this tells you quite a bit about how he saw himself. Now, he was German, therefore he would never abandon a line. A line to German artists was always very essential, and beginning with Dürer back in the 16th century, and now we are arriving at Chile in the 20th century. The line is used very differently, but still very powerfully in both cases. So, as opposed to the Italians, who will always experiment, and the French as well, as we saw with Cezanne, will always exp uh, experiment with tonalities and broad masses of color. The Germans uh, will always have their line in, in, a, in a very kind of jumpy, very uh, jerky but also very intense and expressive uh, way. As you see, he chooses to portray himself uh, in profile while the face is, 
is frontal. It's almost as if he's uh, sort of doing the opposite of the Egyptians with the face and profile and, and the body frontal. And what, what it allows him to do is that with a twisted arm, the arm is twisted, but it looks, I mean, he was a very emaciated, he was a very thin man, but it almost looks as if his ribs were broken, his whole soul is broken. I mean, God only knows what he sees there, but it's, uh, it's a very interesting, uh, interesting portrayal. Still another expressionist who, in fact, will never leave uh, visual reality, and a very interesting man, um, is another German, and his name is Max Beckman. Uh, he just rejected non-representational uh, painting altogether. He felt real painting cannot exist without uh, the visual world because uh, because we are all human beings, and uh, and once once abstraction begins, then we, then then whatever is abstracted is abstracted from our own experience, and therefore cannot really be deeply appreciated. So he greatly admired uh, not only Cezanne and Van Gogh, uh, but Blake that we had just seen, and Rembrandt and Rubens, of course, uh, Northern European artists as well. Medieval stained glass will never be far away from it. One of his very expressive paintings is called The Night, and, uh, and this is 1918. And, uh, and 1918 is just after the war. And in 1917, of course, there was just this the horrific uh, communist revolution in Russia that destroyed the old regime. And uh, Europe was uh, very much swept, much of Europe was swept in the same kind of revolutionary movement. And there was a revolution in Germany in November in 18, which resulted in the replacement of the imperial government uh, with a republic. And this republic, in fact, unleashed just tremendous savagery. The sort that the Soviet uh, new regime unleashed on its own um, population. So that's what Beckman is painting. He is uh, alluding to the horrors that, in fact, were perpetuated by mankind, on mankind. And he is referring to the Soviet revolution and communism by painting this man here on the side who looks sort of like Lenin, who was the leader of the October Revolution in 1917 in uh, the Soviet Union, and that, that cap that he has, and, and the structure of his face, the little beard, that all, uh, anyone who's familiar with that image would recognize it immediately. So the space is extremely dense, very suffocating, and apparently the savage men just broke into a peaceful, a peaceful apartment, and uh, there's a man that they hung just here on the rafters. Whereas the other one, casually, with a pipe in his, uh, in his mouth, he keeps smoking as he's breaking his arm at the same time. There is a woman here who was raped uh, at the same time. And the girl who is uh, being carried away, you can see her feet up there, who's horrified. But, I mean, the whole, the whole image is really horrific and uh, and one when one considers truly the brutality that was perpetuated by a man on man um, this is is uh, yeah this is a very expressive uh, a very expressive manifestation of it and this is his descent from the cross and we've seen other descents when uh, uh, the traditional descents from the cross are uh, they're, they're usually full, uh, full of uh, compassion and uh, uh, while the Nicodemus and uh, Saint Joseph of Arimathea trying to take Christ from the cross, lay him out, uh, do as much as possible to wash his bones, to dress him up, to present him as much as they can to the mother, who was, who is of course horrified, and they, uh, and they know it. This is all very, very different. The mother is uh, not even looking. The uh, uh, Magdalene is holding on to her, and Christ Himself looks already. He doesn't look, in fact, uh, like uh, 
a man just recently dead. He looks already like a skeleton. Plus, uh, plus the rigor mortis. It's the, it's together, and uh, and the two men behind, who are presumably uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, horrified themselves even by touching uh, the body. A very, very different interpretation from the traditional interpretation of that. Here, for instance, here's at least this evokes compassion in us because we see the wounds, we see the human body, and it's torn. It is, uh, it is extremely intense, of course, and expressionistic. But here, there's, even that is, uh, is missing, and the mother herself doesn't even want to look at her child. And you remember George Rowe, as much as we felt that George Rowe himself was in a very expressionistic tradition, he has more compassion even than Max Beckman. Okay. And now we're going to go back slightly, well actually to the middle of the 19th century again, and rehash what is happening and how all of this will be affecting the arts and how Cubism ultimately was born out of it. Technology, technology and technology. England, England was the leader in the technological revolution and England was in fact uh, the first uh, to to start having these international fairs of the show of capitalism. And the first, the very first international fair happened in London, initiated by uh, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband. And uh, it was shown in the so-called Crystal Palace. Uh, it's the first era, the era of industrialization. It covered the years approximately between 1800 and 1938. And in those days, the world expositions were largely focused on trade and displayed technolo technological advances and inventions. Uh, so there were the platforms for the state of the art, science and technology from around the world. So the, as you see, the very first one was in 1851. And then New York, London, Philadelphia. This is the one that we are going to look at, the 1889 in Paris. It will be a centennial, in fact, of the French Revolution, and that's the one we'll look at. Uh, whatever was inside, and, and there was much inside uh, the, the Crystal Palace and all sorts of advances, but what shocked everybody more than anything else was the palace itself. I mean, I mean there was metal and glass structure, and the walls were made all of glass, Metal tracery was almost, uh, I mean, you could see it, of course, but on the outside, not really. And that was extremely impressive. The ability to do something like this was extremely impressive. So, when the time came to have uh, one of those fairs in Paris, uh, and the organizing committee thought about a symbol of this exhibit. They immediately rejected any idea of kind of a, a horizontal building because how can you top uh, the Crystal Palace? It's just not possible. So now they, they were thinking of verticality. And the result became the uh, Eiffel Tower. That is, of course, today the symbol of Paris, one of the symbols, one of the, one of the most recognizable symbols of Paris. Uh, in fact, it was, but just as the Crystal Palace when it was then taken down, I mean, it was moved at one point, but then ultimately taken down. The Eiffel Tower was also supposed to be temporary, but of course it became very permanent. It was seen when it was erected, it was indeed seen as the, uh, this unstoppable, uh, almost phallic expression of the New Age, of masculinity of ingenuity, of engineering. And there were lifts there, just as there are still. One could go up to the Eiffel Tower, and the one was presented with a completely, totally new view of the world. But we must remember we are in a world of hoop skirts and crinolines. They felt themselves very modern, but for us, it's kind of, well, it's old. The most vertical uh, vision they saw was perhaps from the 
Gargoyle Gallery on Notre Dame. But even from that gallery, you still see Paris as Paris. Well, you see the roofs, but you see the roofs kind of on, on, on your level. Uh, you don't see a geometric world. Gertrude Stein, actually, when she took the, her first uh, her first the ride in a plane, because remember also aviation is uh, is nearby. Uh, she was she would write that goodness how Brock and Picasso could see into the future, because as I look down, that's what I see. I see the world made of cubes. I see a flat world made of geometry. I no longer look from down up. I now look from up down and it all seems flat because it's a very different vision than from uh, when, when you see, when, even when you come to Eiffel Tower and, and you see up and it sort of rises before, before your eyes into, into the sky. But then when you go up there, everything is squished, in fact. Everything, there is no perspective. There is, it's just all flat geometry. And it's, it's not that bracket, I, I don't know whether or not they climbed onto the tower. Perhaps, uh, perhaps. But, uh, so this tower now became the symbol of uh, industry, the symbol of greatness. And of course gave society a completely new vision. Uh, here, when you look upwards, uh, the view is, uh, is of sort of a machine that walks across Paris on its four solid legs. And uh, at, at one point, uh, the, a lightning struck uh, the tower and a photograph was taken. It's almost as if God was... A, I mean, one kind of uh, thinks of the, of the Tower of Babel because uh, uh, it was the tallest, the Tower of Babel in the Bible, and then God punished the world that built it by making everybody speak different languages and uh, no one understanding one another. So this almost seemed as a victory uh, over, over an, a, an old superstition because here too people came who spoke all sorts of different languages. Uh, but they now were united by technology. And, and here, even with this lightning uh, and God's wrath, did not destroy the tower, and technology continued. Here, uh, very often they would uh, they would light it up, and uh, with, with the red light. And in fact, we'll see paintings of that. And there you see the fair, right? The illumination of the tower at night during the exposition. You see the exposition mm -hmm. in the uh, in the background. Uh, and here you can see this is Gustave Eiffel, who is the engineer, and he is comparing the Eiffel Tower with the Great Pyramid of Giza. I mean, nothing of that height had ever been created. And this is a panorama of Paris and its suburbs from the top of the Eiffel Tower. And it does, as I said, it looks geometric. Again, let's go back to our chronology. Of course, the motor car was the biggest thing. People still, of course, use rail all the time, but now one could, in fact, move very fast himself, herself. Uh, so, there we go again, the recoil operated machine gun, 82, as much as there was this pion to technology, confidence, idealism, that now everything is possible. Well, of course, the First World War will, will turn technology onto its own population, and everyone will see how horrific technology can be. Uh, Parsons steam turbine, 84, Tesla electric motor, 88, Kodak box camera, 88 also, diesel engine, 92, cinematograph, 94, x-ray, telegraphy, movie camera, 95, uh, so it's, it's all moving with just this incredible, um, incredible speed. And so how to produce uh, in painting this, this, this shift in, in, in consciousness uh, in presence of the new technology because the consciousness is beginning to shift within the same generation. It's not the society that no longer had the luxury of uh, getting used to something and uh, over one generation and another generation comes they already prepared for something new. Things were just going very, very fast 
within a generation. I mean, goodness, I, I mean, Picasso again lived almost till a till hundred. Uh, he's, he's a little like Matisse and, and also lived charmed life. When the First World War came, Spain uh, was neutral and the Second World War didn't affect him much either. So uh, how to produce a parallel kind of dynamism to that, that technology, the idea of technology was producing without, as I said, just, you know, painting, pay, painting a new car. But that was not very satisfactory. Well, cubism will solve it, in a way. A lot of cubist paintings, especially the analytical cubism that we will see, uh, are actually incomprehensible. Uh, I mean, you look at them and you really don't know what's going on. Uh, because Brock and Picasso, Brock first actually, it's just that Picasso was, was such much more of a mercurial spirit that everybody will immediately recognize the name Picasso and will not ne necessarily immediately recognize the name Brock, whereas Brock was, was in fact at the, uh, at the root of it. Uh, Isaiah Berlin, who was a great um, art historian, in the 20th century he kind of said that Fox knows a lot of things and runs around between them, whereas a hedgehog knows one thing, but that thing he knows very well. So in the case of Picasso and Brock, uh, Picasso was a fox and, uh, and Brock was a hedgehog. He, he dug. and. Uh, in, in investigated and analyzed, whereas Picasso was just mercurially sweeping and emulate in his own fashion. So, Brock, as you see it, I mean, they wrote contemporaries. Picasso was born in 81. Look, he was born in 81, and all of these things happened immediately after his birth, in addition to others. And, uh, but he lived, he'll outlive Brock by, uh, by 10 years. He's from Spain, he's Spanish, he will come to Paris in the year 1900 as a 19-year-old and uh, will be extremely attracted, fascinated by this lusty decadence of, uh, of this capital and uh, the famous dancing halls and cabarets, fascinated by you know, the prostitutes and the middle bourgeoisie rubbing shoulders by that, that whole life, uh, which, of course, it, one did not see in provincial Spain at the time. And uh, uh, by, that by, by the time he was 19, he was also, he was already a very accomplished draftsman. He did not yet find his coloristic place but uh, what was required in the art academies, you, one must know how to draw first. You, one must not even think of picking up uh, a brush with color until one knows how to draw. Well, Picasso knew how to draw. Uh, but now he was, uh, he saw what others were doing. And as he lived on in Paris, and then we, of course, we remember 1905, then Matisse came up with his own colors. But then he saw, uh, he was extremely interested uh, and influenced by Toulouse-Lautrec. Very, I mean, the whole, uh, uh, the whole idea of Toulouse-Lautrec, the whole idea of him uh, um, uh, coming from, from such an aristocratic background and yet finding comfort in the... Uh, in the life of the streets, in the life of these cabarets, and painting them in the way he painted them. So the, his early paintings, a lot of them, are in fact influenced very much by Lautrec. Also, the colors, the impressionistic colors, he's beginning to imbibe. And so this one, you see the remember, uh, Renoir, the dance at Moulin de la Galette. Now, Picasso presents it very, very differently. First of all, it's very dark, but not Mane darkness. It's Picasso's mysterious darkness. It's uh, Spanish, actually, because uh, back in the 17th century, Spain was uh, Spanish artists were very influenced by Caravaggio, uh, who was an Italian painter. But then the likes of Ribera in Spain would deepen their canvases, and uh, and of course Picasso was very familiar with all those. So here. That's what he portrays. He portrays decadence. He portrays gorgeousness. He portrays these very, very uh, bright colors. And, uh, and these men who are in their top hats 
uh, who come here to meet women, essentially. So it's a very different portrayal from uh, from Renoir, who uh, uh, who sees these uh, these uh, lovely uh, ca ca cafe dancer and uh, and paints the ambulance, the happiness, the youth. Uh, a very very different personalities. So Cubism and modern art really started uh, in this tenement. It was called uh, the Bateau de Voir, essentially uh, a wash house boat. It's the nickname of a building in Montmartre. Montmartre is uh, the Mount of the Martyr, because uh, the patron saint of Paris is Saint Denis, who is said to have been decapitated at the bottom of the hill, pick up his head, and then walk up the, the mountain, and that's where he lay to rest. So it's called the Mount of the Martyr, Montmartre. Uh, district in Paris that is famous in art history as the residence and meeting place for a group of outstanding early century artists, uh, writers, uh, theater people, the uh, Bohemians. Montmartre was very famous for Bohemians. And, um, and then also, of course, the art dealers. It, uh, well, it was located, here's the address, um, and this is the old photograph, and uh, it it was raised to the ground later, so there's a whole new building there now. And that's where Picasso rented his corner, um, and that's where he began to experiment. And the first four years, uh, uh, when uh, no one knew about him, and of course he was very poor, uh, from Spain, and he saw the poor, he lived with the poor, with the desperate, with the hungry, uh, and he painted them, but he painted them in, 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 this, in this very touching, uh, very expressive uh, fashion, in a very understanding fashion. In fact, he understood these people, you could, and you could feel the empathy, in fact, with this. They're called the Blue Period. It really la it didn't last about three, three and a half years, and uh, very amply uh, named because the, the, the color blue, the color of sadness. and. Uh, and he brought to this his, uh, his incredible ability to draw, to the ability to convey a feeling with the line. And, uh, and here he conveys the sadness, he conveys the, the poverty. Uh, in this case, the old guitarist who is, whose head is bent, who is sitting in the corner. This is all he has left, uh, his guitar. And guitar was very important in the, uh, in the Spanish uh, music, of course, and, uh, and he's all emaciated and, uh, and hungry, uh, and at the same time the, the two prostitutes, they, again, he doesn't paint the faces, they're, they're sitting there, they're having probably a glass of absinthe, as, uh, uh, as we, and, and we saw absinthe was a very cheap and popular drink, and uh, just the way he deepens the shadows on uh, on their backs and uh, and plays with the light and shadow more shadow than light and uh, just conveying their very very tired backs. Another couple at the table. Uh, they uh, and it's interesting because I mean the glass of wine here. Uh, his his hand is around his shoulders, so, so it's not uh, like the glass of absinthe by Degas, where, when they're just two completely separate people. But so his his arm is around her, but they both look in, in, in very different directions. And they're both, again, very emaciated. There's nothing to bring joy to um, to their lives, and except and, and there's uh, nothing but hopelessness in that. And he was very much part of it, except he, um, it seems that he possessed the most incredible self-confidence. Uh, there was this, this young man who was imbued with self-confidence and just nothing stopped him. He was completely convinced of his greatness and uh, he knew he would achieve greatness, it seems. So this lasted about three years, and of course his buyers were other artists on Montmartre or Kunstwaller, actually a German dealer, who would become very, very wealthy ultimately uh, with these. But then things began to kind of look up, 
And uh, so his next, what, another three years, uh, two years even, uh, will be called the so-called Rose period, uh, when he began to introduce, uh, well, rose colors, uh, the yellows, the, uh, the reds. Uh. When he began to introduce a paycheck into his life. Exactly. And as all this, the, uh, the circus workers were always a very interesting subject ever and throughout, because they are these performers who must amuse the audience, who must feel happy, who, uh, but who inside may be anything but. And here is, uh, here is this, this lovely painting uh, of uh, the circus performers. The, uh, the, the, the father, of course, has, has now become older, and he, in fact, in this case, uh, he is now uh, acquired weight, so he, uh, he, he no longer can jump around and, uh, and, and fly under, under the roof. His oldest son does that. He is more of a clown now. That's, that's his occupation now in the circus. The mother, in fact, seems to have died earlier, so Picasso... Uh, pay, I mean, he knew this family, so that's the Picasso paints her in the corner as a separate person looking elsewhere while the family, the boys, all the boys are looking at her, while the father is looking at the eldest son as, uh, well, as his hope in life. And there's a little girl who is, it's very touching actually, because the older brother is holding her by his hand, and it seems that she is in good hands. She is under the protective wing of her brothers, and that things things will work out for them as they're clearly working out for Picasso. It's unclear, the landscape, we don't know where they are, well, but, but circus performers are mobile and, uh, and they go from town to town. They're so It doesn't really matter, it's they themselves that matter to Picasso rather than the, uh, uh, the landscape. He also goes back to classical art. He was very much imbued with classical art. He very much knew classical art. And uh, his La Toilette, uh, the nude, is just jumps out from classical antiquity. And then the other one is dressed. And, and it's it, uh, a very, very uh, classical old master's theme of uh, the uh, uh, sacred and profane love. Uh, Titian painted it. Uh, so this is our sacred love and this is profane love. Uh, one is dressed, the other, the other isn't. Goya, this is Goya, painted it as well. The Lamaha de Nuda, the nude, and the, uh, the other one is dressed. Picasso is painting his own version. Interestingly, he probably is realizing by now that the 20th century, there's going to be much sacred love, that <laughs> most of it is going to be pretty profane. But he's holding himself in check. And uh, again, he, it's, uh, it's sort of Matisse-like. He, he represents the room as, uh, as just two stripes of color. The smaller one is, uh, is darker, the floor, and the lighter one is supposed to be the wall, but there is no specification of uh, geometry. His uh, patroness, so to speak, will be Gertrude Stein. Uh, she and Leo Stein were brother and sisters. And uh, they left New York and came to Paris. They were very wealthy. And in Paris they established an open house, essentially. And, uh, and they helped these uh, new artists very much. Uh, and anybody could come to their house and, uh, and they borrow money or sell a painting and uh, be able to live on. And if you haven't seen Woody Allen's film called The Midnight in Paris, it's highly recommended, and you will see, in fact, Gertrude Stein there. He does this pre-cubist portrait of Gertrude Stein in the manner of uh, Dominic Inge, who painted uh, an industrialist back in the 19th century. She sort of she's larger than life in in her person, and she spills out of the frame. Of course, what he's now beginning to use, he goes back to his roots in Iberia, the pre-Roman roots even, and looks at Iberian sculpture, which is a subset of I Iberian art, uh, and describes the various sculptural styles developed in, uh, well, what's called Spain, in the Iberian Peninsula, 
from Bronze Age on to the up to the Roman conquest, I said before the Romans. And uh, for this reason, it is sometimes described as the pre-Roman Iberian sculpture. And uh, so you see, you see the forms. And this was very, that influenced Picasso greatly. And you see the same sort of eyes here that he's giving to, uh, to Gertrude Stein. And, uh, and then the same idea, this Iberian uh, idea of the Bronze Age, of the pre-Roman sensibilities and aesthetic, he now begins to apply uh, to his new, to his new art. I mean, Picasso will be changing styles throughout his life. There's nothing consistent about it. I mean, look how different it is. I and mean, before, when we looked at the two women at the bar, I mean, they're emaciated. They are so thin. They they could fly. They're so thin. Whereas this is almost Giotto, the uh, the early 14th century Italian painter. Uh, it's very sculptural. It, it, it's very three-dimensional. It has a lot of mass. And uh, she stands in front of uh, a mirror and she's, she's solid. She's built up of solidity. And uh, as I said, he, uh, he's using, and the face as well, is uh, that of the Lady of Elki, as you see here. Um, and then, and then he discovers a totally different culture. Uh, not that he's interested in to know what this culture is about. It's just that in Paris there was an exhibition of uh, tribal masks from Africa. And by this time, you see, uh, remember in 1905, Matisse came up with his colors, with his fauvism. And that was the latest thing. And Matisse was the most famous artist. And he had to be beat. And then, and then uh, Picasso has this revelation of what he's going to do. is, is kind of the pinnacle of uh, Western fascination with other cultures. And remember in the 19th century, the cultures of Japan, the cultures of... Uh, um, of Palestine, the cultures of uh, Northern Africa, all of that. And then Gaga went so far as, in fact, to go and um, be immersed in that culture and use it in his own art. Now Picasso discovered for himself the African, the African carvings. In his search for new forms, he, it's a revelation for him. And yes, he just goes and, to, uh, and appropriates, in fact, the, the forms and, uh, and motifs, it becomes sort of the, the climax of the, of the exotic, of the distant, that fascinated the Western society for, um, for so long. Um, but you must understand that for these people and for uh, the Western society, these ritual, this ritual art was not, they did not equate it with art. They were just curiosities. That's how they looked at it, because again, the end of the 19th century was the rush for the exploration of Africa, for colonization of Africa. And as the West grabbed more and more and more territory in Africa, stuff began to come in. And, and, and the, uh, so the carvings as well. They didn't really care about the tribal meanings or about the societies. So Cubism uh, ultimately uh, became kind of a parody of the uh, imp of the imperial model. It was, uh, I mean, cultural plunder. I mean, he didn't care about the African art. Uh, he only what he cared about was the formal vitality of it, the, the the freedom to distort. Well, these artists they looked back at expressionism, at German expressionism, and the way the, that the expression tries to dis try to distort visual imagery, even even Max Beckman, uh, for the sake of expression. But what they didn't understand is that for, for those tribes, for the people, these were not forms of European expressionism. Picasso didn't see any of that. He saw the, uh, the clash of emotions. He saw the uproar. He saw something climactic. And the, he saw vehemence that fascinated him. And so that's what he used 
in his own art. Uh, and that's what we see in his notorious, famous Le Demoiselle d'Avignon. Now, we had seen, uh, Picasso actually didn't like this, uh, this name and it was given later. He, in fact, I think called it the brothel because there was uh, a, a house of ill repute in Barcelona on the street that was called Avignon, the street of Avignon. His original sketch was, uh, you know, he used that same topic that uh, Toulouse-Lautrec used with such sympathy and understanding the so-called parade and when women sit in, dressed in their best clothes in the evening before men come in to choose which one they want. So that's what it is. It's the parade. Except he paints them as nude and he had... And in the original, in, in fact in his uh, original presentation, uh, there was a sailor. Barcelona is a port city. There was a sailor enjoying himself in the midst of all the nudes. And the medical student who is walking in with a book because syphilis, gonorrhea, all these sexually transmitted diseases were rampant. So that was his original uh, idea. Um, and then he decided to, to do away uh, with the men. But you know, interestingly enough, it is st he's so steeped in... Uh, uh, in classical art, I mean, I bet you he is probably thinking about the three graces. Because these three are very different from these two. Very different. Uh, either the three graces, or maybe, I mean, this, the figure in the center, these two figures, we don't really know, are they lying down, are they standing up? It's very, very unclear. And the sheets behind them, whether they're the sheets, they look like broken glass, in fact. I mean, everything hurts. Uh, you'll find many art historians who will talk about uh, Picasso's horrific fear of women, fear of uh, emasculation, fear of castration. I mean, this is horrific. Everything is broken. Everything hurts. I mean, even, even melon. I mean, there's the melon here and little grapes, and, uh, and I, all of that is just delicious fruit. He left this woman here, sort of uh, drawing the curtain, and here, this is where he went to town. It's not a cubist, it's kind of a pre-cubist um, painting. And uh, what, what he's doing here is, it, I mean, he's going towards cubism. Uh, it's a th synthetic image, because our knowledge, again, of an object, includes the front, the back, the sides. I mean, we know what the object looks like. And uh, so why not synthesize it all together and present it in one view? Uh, the back, the front, but this is where he goes to town with the carvings, you see. This is one carving, this is carving, this is carving. He's just using them to present this. Um, well, he certainly cut the floor from underneath Matisse with those. Uh, it actually will not be shown first. At first, only these friends and close acquaintances will see it. But even they were, uh, were taken aback uh, by this painting. Today, of course, it's, it's what it costs hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars. But uh, uh, this will be the future.